Do you suddenly find yourself in need of the ability to host a webinar or video conference? If so, I've got seven basic tips for webcasting. Hey, I'm Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, here from my partially built-out studio in the Vatican. Uh, the world is a strange place right now because of the global pandemic. We've been asked to socially isolate ourselves, and part of that strategy is to work from home via webinars and video conferencing. Uh, if you're on the internet watching me right now, it means that you at least understand a little bit about how these technologies work. Maybe you've done a video call, a Skype call on the laptop to the grandkids. But I want to give you some of the basic tips to translate that sort of amateur video call into a more professional webcast. Now, the reason why we're doing this is because we don't want people who are watching you on your webinar or in your video conference to think about the technology. We want that to be secondary, and instead we want them listening to and seeing your message. Now, let's kick it off with tip number one, get with the program. This one sounds simple, but it's actually really important. We all have the programs that we enjoy because we use them, because we become accustomed to them. Some people are Skype, some people are FaceTime, some people are Discord, whatever it might be, my first piece of advice is to use whatever your organization is using. If they use WebEx, use WebEx. If they use Zoom, use Zoom. If they are a Microsoft Teams group, you gotta learn Microsoft Teams. Now that's not saying that one is better than the other, but you have to recognize that you might need more help than what I can offer you over a video series. So if you're using the same software suite that your organization is using for all of its people, it means it's that much more likely that you're going to be able to get the help that you need. The good news is that all of these software suites basically work the same way. They have three components, a camera, a microphone, and some way to share what's going on on your desktop which means that if you learn how to use one suite, that knowledge will translate over to all the others. So if you learn how to use Skype, you'll be able to use Zoom. If you learn how to use Zoom, you'll be able to use GoToWebinar. If you use GoToWebinar, you'll know the best practices for using a GoToMeeting. Tip number two, no mobile devices. We love our mobile devices, and our mobile devices have come a long way. The cameras on these things are actually phenomenal. They're probably better than any of the cameras I currently have in this studio. But here's the thing. This size, this form factor is never going to be able to do what you need it to do for a professional webcast. The screen's too small. It's not expandable enough. It doesn't have the flexibility that you need when you're doing, say, a 10-person video conference, or if you're doing a webinar for 90 students. What you need is the power of a laptop or a desktop instead of a tablet or a phone. So although it may be really convenient to use one of these bad boys, get yourself a larger machine. Tip number three, build a broadcast space. The more time you put into building your broadcast space, the less time you will take troubleshooting. Now, when I think of building a broadcast space, I'm thinking of four main things. The first thing is, and I know that this is going to strike at the heart of some people who uh, love working outdoors, is no natural sunlight. Yeah, you might be tempted to go out because I love the sun. I love the fresh air. I love the idea of having some beautiful vista behind me. Let's say you, you live on a bluff like at LMU. But here's the problem. If you're working outside, it means you are at the mercy of natural sunlight. And the sun, respective to us, moves position, which means the shadows are going to change, which means that as, say, clouds move by, the amount of lighting will change dramatically. If you're going to be doing a webcast, if you're going to be doing a webinar or a video conference, you want to remove all the possible changes during that webinar because you don't want to focus on how is my lighting? How do I look? How do I sound? All those things are made more difficult by having a webinar, a webcast outdoors. Now, even if you move it indoors, you need to stay away from the windows, again, because of that dynamic lighting. And that leads me to number two, which is put yourself near a wall. And by this, I mean facing a wall. Now, why might you want to face a wall? Quite simply, it's because lighting is funny that way. If you take a light source and you shine it directly at yourself, it's not going to look great. What you're going to end up having is you're going to end up having a light source that makes you look 
like this. It's really sharp. You get shadows. It's going to blow you out. However, if you take that same light source, and let's pretend that this is my wall, and you shine it up against the wall, this is what happens. The light gets diffuse. It actually makes you a lot better. And uh, it's a lot easier to use than, uh, say, a, a halogen that's shining straight into your face. Now, you, you could get the same effect by, again, taking something like this and making sure that it's aimed in the right direction during your broadcast, but you could also just take advantage of what kind of room you've got your broadcast space in and just uh, bounce light off the wall. The third thing is all about the chair, and that is avoid a swivel chair. Yes, swivel chairs are comfortable. I love swivel chairs. I've got one right over there for when I'm editing, but when you're broadcasting, you have to remember that the camera is static. It's not going to follow you around. It's not like you're teaching in front of a classroom where the students will follow you as you pace from one side to the next. Because your camera is one in one place, you need to stay in one place. And that becomes much more difficult if you start swiveling back and forth. Now, as you get better, as you get more comfortable, as you get more proficient, you could add a swivel chair, but until then, just make sure you've got a static chair with good padding. The last bit that I would have you consider when you're designing a space is to have a large monitor. I've actually got a monitor right now off to the side of the camera so my notes can be up. Now, why do I have that? Well, for two reasons. First, I want something that I can use to look at my notes without having to stare down because having to stare down when you're on camera does not inspire confidence. You want that to be part of your message, which is, I am telling you this, this information, and you can trust this information because I look like you should trust me. I, I know it, it sounds a little shallow, but this is one of the, the tips and tricks of webcasting. The other reason why I want to have a monitor is because it sort of balances out the space. It's going to draw my eyes to where my camera is, and therefore it makes it, well, more compelling. Now, you don't have to have a huge monitor, but something that you can read without squinting, something you can read without having to look down or up is always a plus. Let's go ahead and move on to tip number four, no wireless networking. I get it. Everybody loves Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi makes our jobs so much easier because I can move from my bedroom to my office, to the kitchen, to the living room, wherever it might be, and broadcast. But Wi-Fi is not the most dependable technology. It's great. I love it. I use it all the time. But unfortunately, dropouts are very common. I know what you're probably saying to yourself. You're saying, wait, I, I watch Netflix. I watch entire movies over Amazon Prime. I watch a lot of YouTube. And aside from a bit of buffering here and there, I never really run into any problems. Well, here's the thing. When you're streaming content from the internet and it's static content, it's not changing as you're watching it, it's easy to buffer. I can buffer one minute, two minutes, 10 minutes ahead of time, which means that even if the connection drops out, as long as it's reestablished before the buffer runs out, I don't even notice. It seems as if everything has been seamless. If you're doing a live broadcast from your broadcast space, you don't get that luxury. You might have one or two seconds of buffer, depending on what software you're using, but more or less, it's a live event. So if you lose connectivity, people are gonna notice. Your video stops, your audio drops out, or it pixelates. Now, with Wi-Fi, it's a shared technology, which means it can be interfered with. You might have a phone that's on the wrong frequency. You might have other Wi-Fi clients that are using up all the available RF spectrum. If you go wired, you avoid that. So no Wi-Fi and nothing but wired. Now, what does this mean practically? If you've got a desktop, you've probably got an Ethernet jack on the back, so you can just plug that straight into your switch or your router. If you've got a laptop, you probably don't have an Ethernet jack, which means you're gonna to have to get yourself a dongle, like one of these, a USB to Ethernet dongle, or maybe your Thunderbolt dongle if you've got a Mac. Now, no matter what you need, you also need to pick up cable, enough cable to connect your desktop or your laptop to your switch or to your router. Now, the nice thing about that is with Ethernet, you can go 333 feet away, so I'm pretty sure you're gonna be able to route the cable around so that you can make your broadcast space a little neater and a little less trip-worthy. Tip number five, audio is king. I know that a lot of organizations are putting a lot of their time, a lot of their resources, a lot of their money into making good video. In fact, that's what this room and my other studio is all about. We make video. But here's one of the strange things about video. People are willing to put up with bad picture here and there. They're not willing to put up with bad audio. 
Now, if your picture is a little fuzzy, if it goes pixelated, even if it freezes, the human mind is wired to sort of make up for what's going on. But if the audio drops out, it's bad. And if it's grating, if your voice sounds too tinny, if there's not enough bass, if it's distorted, or God forbid, if you're using those earbuds that comes with, come with iPhones, it, it's, it's enough to drive people away. They may not log off of your broadcast, but they're probably not listening. It's not their fault. That's what the human brain is wired to do, to sort of filter out distractions. So what you need to do is not sound like a distraction. That starts with you not using any of the integrated audio in your laptop or your desktop. Yes, that means that you're not using the little array that comes on your laptop. I don't care how good they say it is, it's still going to sound like someone speaking into a speakerphone. That might work for a three-minute video conference. That's horrible for a 90-minute webinar or an hour-long video conference. Now, this also means that you can't use the analog ports on your laptop or your desktop. Why? Well, because we just don't know how good they are. The quality of those pieces of hardware and the device drivers that run them can vary greatly from model to model, manufacturer to manufacturer. So you might have a great Plantronics headset that you plug into the audio ports, and maybe it works great on one computer and maybe on another, all you hear is buzz and clickings, and all it does is make your voice sound so compressed. So just don't do that. In fact, we wanna make it easier for you to webcast by getting yourself a USB microphone. Now, this is the one that I've been carrying around for about a decade now. They've got more modern versions, but uh, I like the entire line. This is the black wire. This particular one is the 720 from Plantronics. Now, this is so old that the pleather is actually coming apart. That's how long I've had this thing, and yet it is a workhorse. It folds up really nicely, it's very light, it's very portable, and it's sort of the perfect thing to, to get on a budget because you can get these from $40 all the way up to 100 and plus, depending on what kind of features you want. Now, the other thing I really like about this is it has two ways to mute. First, I can mute just by throwing up the microphone. If I put the microphone up, it's gonna automatically mute. When I bring it back down, it, uh, it turns the microphone back on. Why is that important? Well, sometimes during a broadcast, you're going to sneeze, you're going to cough, you're going to need someone to say something to you off camera. Well, if you've got the, uh, the, the mute button only in the software, it means you're going to have to search through the software, through the interface, to find that mute button and then make sure you unmute it. With this, you've got a very clear indication of when it's muted and when it's not. Not only can I use the mic swivel, but I've also got this. This little control actually lights up when it's muted and it gives me a physical button I can press that is independent of my software. Again, I am such a fan of anything that makes the webcast that much simpler, that much easier, and this definitely does that. Tip number six, no integrated cameras. This tip is a lot like the last one in that I'm saying don't use the integrated hardware on your laptop or desktop. Now, why, you might be asking. I mean, after all, when you bought your laptop, they probably said that it, it has a great web camera, you know, high resolution, and, and that's true. There probably is a decent sensor that probably does have the software to make it all work. There's two problems with that. One, because they have to fit it in such a thin area, normally the optics are trash, which means it's never gonna look right. Even though they have a good sensor, they probably don't have a good piece of glass getting the light into the sensor. The other thing is it's at the wrong height. You see, your laptop is normally gonna be on your desk, which means your screen is gonna be bent back like this, which means you're gonna spend the entire time with the other side of your webinar, your webcast looking up your nose. That's not a really flattering shot. What you wanna do is position your camera so that it's right about eye level. Not too high, not too low, but dead on. Now, I have done this in the past by stacking books or boxes underneath the laptop in order to get it to the right place, but that's something I only do in case of emergency. What you want is a solution that's going to allow you to create that same look and feel without having to prop up your notebook, and that means that you're going to get yourself an external USB camera. Now, this is a Logitech. This is the 900 series. This one's actually quite old, almost as old as my Blackwire headset, and again, I travel everywhere with this thing because it's fantastic. Logitech has the new 922X Pro and 920S Pro. Those are between $60 and $90. And not only will these allow you to position your camera exactly where you need them, but uh, they have a tripod. 
which means you can sort of mount it. You can get that, that perfect placement with a nice tripod and just keep your camera there. It also means that you can keep your laptop within typing distance rather than having to sort of push it back or bring it forward. Again, this is all for the convenience. It's to make the tech disappear because you don't want the people to, on the other side of the webcast to see you struggling with the technology. Tip number seven, see the light. Now, I've already told you why you don't want to be using natural sunlight, but there's also reasons for you not to use the lights in your house. If you've got incandescent lights, A, they get hot. B, the, the light tends to be a bit orange. And if you use regular fluorescent lights, the light will tend to be bluish or greenish. What you kind of want is balanced lighting. Now, I understand if you just have to use whatever you've got, but if you've got even a little bit of money and time, you can get a picture that is so much better. Now, this is a light that I got off of Amazon. I can't even remember where I got this. This is almost as old as that other gear for about $17. It runs on AA batteries, or I've got a battery eliminator so I can just plug it into the wall. And it gives me some decent, some decent LED light. It's nice and smooth. I can use this to either bounce off the wall, or if I get this far enough back, I can do a direct lighting through this diffuser screen. Now, there are lights on Amazon right now, ring lights for less than $20. And we can go all the way up to include lights like the one I use in the studios. These are the uh, GVM 520s. Now, you don't have to get one of these, but I do suggest that you get some sort of lighting because it will allow you to control what your picture looks like. Again, we want to create the illusion that you have no technology. It should be a presentation. It should be something where you're just speaking to people. And the more that you can make sure your setup is perfect, the more that message comes through. Now, all told, the total price for everything is about $80 up to, well, 120 or so dollars. So this is incredibly inexpensive. It should be easy for you to start up your webcasting career. Now, in future episodes of this series, I'm going to be showing you some of the other things that I use. Better hardware, for example, things like this microphone, this Heil PR40 combined with an XLR to USB adapter. I'm going to be showing you headsets like the HyperX series. These are my personal favorites, which will do more than just video conferencing, more than just webinaring. These are also really good for music or uh, for gaming. In fact, the Alpha is probably one of the most comfortable headsets I've ever used and their Cloud Orbit is one of the best sounding headsets that I've ever used. I'm gonna show you some of the lights that I've got in my studio. I'm gonna show you some of the software tips and tricks that I've learned over the years. I'm gonna show you this. This is the Blackmagic ATEM Mini. This is my switcher that I use instead of a switcher in software so that I can go between four different inputs, which means I can have, say, two computers and two cameras or one camera and three different computers or, say, a DVD Blu-ray player. Whatever I might want, as long as it's HDMI, I can get it in here and switch between my angles. It's a fantastic piece of hardware, and this only costs $300. I'm also going to show you some very low cost cameras in case you want to create a more professional look. And I am going to give you some tips on how to decorate your background, your studio. So as you go on, people again become a bit more accustomed to your style and hear what you're saying. Now, don't forget to like and subscribe if you like this video and if you want to hear more. And please, please follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ you can ask me specifically to cover your solution. Let's say you do Zoom. Let's say you're having trouble doing GoToWebinar. I can bring you into those clients and show you exactly how to connect the hardware that I'm gonna be showing you to those clients. Finally, if you really enjoy this series, please use the links in the description. I'm gonna be putting up some affiliate links. Yes, we are gonna get a little bit of money for that. It just means that I'm gonna be able to support this series going into the future. Any assistance would be greatly appreciated. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser, thanking you for your time and reminding you that there's no Uber Geek without you.